in the following sense. Well, let me start out and just say, if, okay, what's the integral from, let's say, 0 to pi over 2 of the cosine function? That's, I'm not trying to do anything fancy here. I just need to know what that number is. That's the antiderivative sine x from 0 to pi over 2, and that would be sine of pi over 2 minus sine of 0, which is 1. Okay? So if you were to graph the cosine function, what I've just said is if you take that portion right there, uh, the area is 1. And that's something you might just keep in the back of your mind. It's handy, especially in physics courses and things. How much area is there under one loop of a cosine or a sine curve? Two units under an entire uh, peak or valley, whichever way you want to look at it. Now, here comes the funny stuff. What if I continue this curve on forever? Okay. What's the total area? And that's including pluses and minuses. Uh, let me put it down in, in things that I don't have to explain. What I would like to say is, what is this expression right here, where I integrate not just from 0 to a finite number, but to some infinite number, or the infinity as an upper limit? What value should I attach to that? Well, we can get into something of a discussion at this point. There's a unit there. Down here will be how much? Two. And I haven't put any absolute values in or anything, so I really should call it a negative two if you're going to deal with that particular integral up there. There's a plus two here. Uh, it's going a bit further. Here's a minus two. Plus two eventually, minus two, et cetera. So what would you like to put down for that particular integral? I'll take any answer. Depending. Okay, you say the area from zero to pi over two. The reason is the other would cancel. The minus two cancels with the plus two. Minus two cancels with plus two. Cancel forever, except for those cancellations. You've got this one area left. So there is an answer. I'm going to give you another one. How about if I just cancel? this 2 with that 2, uh, this 2 with that 2, and I'm left with minus 1. Okay? Well, that's not good. That is, it's not nice to have two answers. Both of them seem to use the same philosophy. It's just the way you happen to look at the problem. Now, this is not an indeterminate form. It's not a matter of saying, well, those are guesses for a particular case. We are looking at the particular case, and we cannot agree on what the evaluation should be. So as it turns out, this thing probably shouldn't even exist. There should be no number attached to it, because it looks like there are two candidates, and I'm not uh, important enough to say that Mr. Penny's wrong and I'm right. We seem to have basically the same ideas. Okay? So those are the kinds of problems that we have to worry about, that kind of stuff right there. Let's take a look at another one. Roughly the same idea. I would perhaps like to attach a number to this expression. And again, let's take a look at what the picture might be. We're taking a curve uh, at 0. This is 1. And if you check it out, the curve looks something like this. And let me push you in a certain direction. Let's let me point out that this is an unbounded region. Unbounded region means that it's not contained within any, within any circle, let's say. I mean, you might have a giant circle that contains your whole region. That would be a bounded region, but this one is not. There's always a little bit further down the axis. So 
what would you think would be the answer to this particular question? As an area, anybody have any ideas as to what the value should be? Negative one. Negative, negative pardon? Negative one. Negative one? Hmm. Why negative? I would be suspicious that it's negative. Well, I was just substituting in and actually evaluating it. Okay, so you're trying to substitute stuff in and evaluating. Well, that's a kind of the problem is that uh, how do you plug in infinities? That's, well, I was thinking that's what we're dealing with. If you go to infinity, then the number will go to zero. Okay. You're not leaning the way I was hoping for this thing. Right? I was hoping someone would say, a is an unbounded region, shouldn't the area be infinity? Because there's always a little bit more out there. Okay. Uh, that's a good guess. And it kind of falls into the same situation that I was just talking about. That is, we have to deal with integrals, literally, in lots of different scientific applications. We have to deal with integrals that have these infinite limits of integration. And let's take this example as one to kind of get you into the right frame of mind. <coughs> the suggestion actually is rather good. And let me point out what that suggestion is, make it a little bit more clear. What we're going to do is actually integrate from 0 to t to get that orange area, whatever it may be, and then we'll let t go out to infinity. And then obviously the area in the orange region will swell out to the total yellow area. Uh, there would be other ways to do this, but this is the way it's traditionally done. Again, we'll take that orange area from 0 to t, let t go to infinity as a limit, and that orange area should expand out to the yellow area and give us, if there is a number, uh, the evaluation that we seek. So with that kind of as a philosophy, I guess, it will be a definition shortly. The problem then comes down to taking a limit as t goes to infinity of this thing here. Okay, and this thing we can evaluate. That's no problem. I'll kind of do it in my head for you. It's a minus 1 over x plus 1 from 0 to t. That's what the evaluation of that integral is. So the limit we seek, when you plug in the limits of integration, would be if you plug in the top limit, uh, minus 1 over t plus 1, and then we'll have a negative minus 1 over 0 plus 1. So I put my antiderivative in there, plug in the limits of integration. Here's where Mr. Shea got his, his signs wrong. There are lots of signs to worry about. Anyway, he was right, though. As t goes to infinity, this expression goes to 0, pretty obviously. Double negative, plus 1. And that was what was supposed to be surprising for some people, maybe. That is, you can have an unbounded region with an area which is finite. In fact, in this particular case, the total area is 1, a single unit. So that was kind of quick. Let me point out that the orange area that I was talking about, if you look at our expression over there, turns out to be a 1 minus 1 over t plus 1. Kind of changing things around, that orange area from 0 to t is 1 minus 1 over t plus 1. And you could see then that that's a bit short of 1 for large t. And as t goes to infinity, that swells up to the value of 1. So it's possible to have unbounded regions with finite areas. Okay? Well, what happened to this guy over here? What, what was his problem? If you take the same philosophy, that is, we ought to back off from infinity, evaluate from 0 to t, what, what will happen here? Well, if you try to do it, you'll evaluate this as sine x, Plug in your limits of integration. Again, I'm doing this more quickly than I should probably, but let's not get bogged down in integration techniques this time. What happens to that limit as t goes to infinity? What does the sine function do? What 
the sine t do as t goes infinity? Well, it does basically what the cosine does. It just wobbles back and forth. This thing, we should say, does not exist. It keeps whipping back and forth between minus and plus 1. So because that limit does not exist, that means this limit does not exist. That integral as a limit does not exist. And so that seems to correspond to uh, what I said originally, that things shouldn't have a value. Whereas, even though you might think this one shouldn't, it really does. Let me spell out then at least one part of improper integrals. And I'll probably let you read the book for most of the rest of them. An expression of this type, an integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is defined to be a limit as t goes up to infinity. I'm going to use this uh, indication. I'm going to use arrows to say moving up two values. I'll use downward pointing arrows moving down a to t f of x dx. Okay. What you're going to do for your homework problems is evaluate this. Check to see if the limit exists. Okay. If the limit exists, the improper integral, I never told you what that is, but that's, that's one right up there staring you in the face. It's improper. That improper integral is said to converge So there's a new word. You'll see it in bold black print in your book. If the limit exists, the improper integral converges. Otherwise, it, we can say, diverges. And what we're doing, of course, is using the <coughs> words of limits. This integral converges means the limit converges, etc. Now, what really makes an integral improper? What's so bad about these integrals? Well, let me point out to you what happened way back when. An integral from a to b, f of x dx, which is what we've been doing quite a bit of lately now, makes sense for a and b finite and f of x continuous. Those were the only kinds of definite integrals that we've dealt with up till now. You take a finite interval and you take a nice smooth function over that interval and you develop the definite integral. And what that meant was you chop up the interval into n equal parts, use rectangles, take limits, etc. Now you can see the problem here is that you cannot take an infinite line and chop it up into, let's say, n equal parts. You're going to run into problems there. So what we have to do is back off and get ourselves a proper integral. That's what I'll call this thing down here. There is a proper integral, nice finite interval. And we'll assume it's a nice continuous function. Take the limit, and that's what we're going to attach to that thing, if it's possible. So looking over here, this integral is divergent or diverges because there's no limit. Over here, this improper integral is convergent, and you say it converges to 1. Okay, so th that's all the words we're going to run across.